Healthcare Money Campfire Stories by Eric Bricker, MD. Chapter 7. You see in Afghanistan. As a resident physician, we had many repeat patients. Sometimes we would see the same person every three or four months. Sometimes we would say this, see them every month or even every week. Mr. S was those once a month patients. Mr. S was a man in his mid forties who had also been born and raised in Baltimore. In his teens, he began using drugs and became involved in gang activity, selling drugs. Mr. S was well-spoken, ambitious, and above all, smart. He was probably one of the sharpest patients I'd ever have. As a result of his characteristics, he rose to become the local leader of his gang and head drug dealer. I am no expert in gang activity. According to how Mr. S told me his story, his sales and neighborhood territory were growing. Another local gang was not happy about him encroaching on their space. He had several run-ins with them. That's how Mr. S described them. I do not know exactly what a run-in is, but he did not go into further detail. However, the disputes came to a head one evening when the rival gang members had pounced on Mr. S on the street and caught him. They proceeded to take him to a corner telephone booth and had him dial 911. They told him to tell the dispatch operator his location and that he was going to be shot. In future tense. At that moment, a rival gang member put a handgun to the base of Mr. S's neck from the back and pulled the trigger. His intent was not to kill Mr. S, but rather he knew that by shooting him in the spine, Mr. S would most likely survive and be a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. He wanted to eliminate Mr. S's competition on the street. Also, he wanted him to suffer a life of disability and send a warning to anyone else who thought about selling drugs in their territory. As expected, Mr. S survived and was paralyzed from the neck down. Mr. S was down, but not out. He was light on the details, but he had several family members and friends who would feed him, bathe him, change the catheter in his bladder, and wipe his bottom after he had a bowel movement. As a drug dealer, Mr. S. was also a drug addict. Mr. S.'s family and friends would also help him shoot up heroin. Not only did Mr. S. continue doing drugs, he continued to work as a drug dealer. His people would come in and out of his bedroom, and he would issue directions and orders. He maintained his supply of drugs, divided the money, and took care of people when they got out of line. Mr. S. had been married and divorced three times. The years passed. As a quadriplegic, he developed contractures in his arms and legs. Because he was not able to move his extremities, they would become stiff and curled in. Often people who are paralyzed have soft braces that keep their joints in a straight position so that they do not develop contractures. Mr. S. did not have soft braces. Eventually, he had blown out all of his veins from shooting up heroin. He had switched over to skin popping, where one injects the heroin just under the skin to form a bubble. The high is not as good as injecting heroin into the veins, so eventually Mr. S. switched from skin popping to narcotic pain pills. Heroin and narcotic pain medications slow down the intestines to the point that they cause mild and then moderate and then severe constipation. Being unable to stand or walk and having to lie in bed all day also leads to constipation. As a result, Mr. S. had severe constipation, intestinal blockage, and abdominal pain. This pain is what brought Mr. S. to the emergency room and to our medical floor. Mr. S. and I did not meet in the hospital until about a dozen years after his gunshot to the neck. He had stopped using and dealing drugs. He said he was too old for that now. He had been admitted to the hospital for severe constipation and associated gastrointestinal blockage for years. When he became my patient for the first time as an intern, the senior residents and attending physician were already very familiar with him. Clean him out, Bricker, they ordered. I knew what that meant. We had to get all the stool out of his colon. As usual, I ordered laxatives and enemas. No results. Mr. S. knew this would happen. You gotta pull it out, he would say to me every morning on daily rounds. By pull out, he meant manual disimpaction. That is the medical term for putting a glove on and sticking your finger up the patient's rectum to pull out the stool.
Mr. S had been manually disimpacted many times. He knew it was needed to relieve his obstruction. Given that Mr. S laid in bed all day and no longer sold drugs, he occupied himself by watching CNN and Fox News. My residency at Hopkins was during the height of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Therefore, Mr. S was an expert on international affairs. He loved to talk about it. Interestingly, he was a fan of President George Bush's approach. The process of manually disimpacting a person is rather slow. I'll spare you the details, but while I was removing stool from Mr. S's rectum, the TV in the room was on and turned to CNN. As usual, the news anchors were discussing the war in Afghanistan. Mr. S chimed in, You see, in Afghanistan, you've got to get them on their own turf. They mess with you, you got to let them know that ain't cool, and you got to do to them worse than what they did to you. You see, that's what Bush is doing. He's saying, don't mess with us. Then he proceeded to name and easily pronounce the senior leaders of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and what he thought their next move would be. He talked about Guantanamo Bay. He talked about Iraq. He could have written for the journal Foreign Affairs. Apparently, geopolitics is similar to running a gang. So there I am, hands full of stool learning about world affairs from a constipated quadriplegic ex-drug dealer. At the hospital, patients who are admitted often have the in uh, insensitive name Frequent Flyers. Mr. S. was one of them, but we had many more. Ms. Q. was a frequent flyer with sickle cell anemia. Ms. S. had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. We even had a competition at the end of each year to see which patient had the most admits. Every year, it was the same gentleman, Mr. K. My intern year, he had 54 admissions, more than one per week. Most of the frequent flyers had either no insurance or had Medicaid, which means the hospital most likely was not reimbursed enough to cover the cost of each admission. Lesson learned. Hospitals don't just treat sick people. They are also insurance companies. They take on the financial risk for the health of the community. The ER is always open and has to take anyone. Many of these patients come back repeatedly and cause the hospital to lose money. Often these people have very unstable social situations. Many are mentally ill. Hopkins did not have a community outreach program to effectively keep them from coming back. Most hospitals don't. They just continue to lose money on their care. To make up for money-losing patients, hospitals strategize ways to make more money off people with commercial insurance. The industry jargon for this approach is called cross-subsidization. They increase their prices on commercial insurance and charge 5 to 10 times what they would charge the government under Medicare. They buy imaging centers in upscale suburbs and charge high hospital rates for scans there. They buy physician practices to keep the referrals for tests and procedures coming into their hospital. They advertise service lines on TV commercials and billboards to bring in patients to the money-making areas of the hospital, orthopedics, cancer, and cardiology. None of this is wrong. It just makes healthcare more expensive for people and businesses with commercial health insurance. Robbing Peter to pay Paul is just how healthcare finance works in America.